Let's open our Bibles to James chapter 1, continuing on in the book of James. Last week we were encouraged by James in verses 1 to 8 about understanding the profit that comes when we go through trials. And I took some time last week describing the difference between uh, the word trials and temptation. And in the, in the Greek language, which the New Testament is written in the Greek language, there's a single word, uh, but it has different meanings depending on the context of the passage. And so we learn that God does test his children and he tests his children in order to reveal the quality and the depth of their faith. The same word is used for temptation. Satan tempts people, entices us to sin, to bring our downfall and to bring destruction into our lives. And so uh, we learned the profit of going through trials, enduring them is the word that's used. Uh, look at verse 3, if you would, knowing that the testing of your patience produces, excuse me, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And that, that's kind of what we focused on last week. Not giving up when things are difficult, pushing through in a godly fashion, not taking any shortcuts. Today we uh, look at verses 9 to 18. Let me read those verses. And what we're going to be studying today is how to endure trials, truths that help us have the right attitude, and it's very much about attitude when we're going through hard times, enduring trials and understanding sin. So let me read verses 9 through 18, and then we'll have a word of prayer. James tells us, let the, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat then it withers the grass, the flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been proved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creation. Let's pray together. Dear Father, as we're gathered here, would you teach us? May our, may our hearts be leaning into you, Lord. May we believe and expect that you have a word for us today, a teaching, a correction, or perhaps planting a new thought that we've never considered. Lord, that we may endure trials well because we will have them and that we may understand the nature of sin, Lord, and that we could avoid it, God. Pray your blessings over this group. Bless those dear teachers, those, those helpers, those children's ministry workers, Lord, as they take care of those precious kids, God. Bless them. And have your way with us today, Lord, we pray. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. James, the first, if you look at your notes here, the first Roman numeral number one, truths that help us endure through trials. Guys, trials are, are hard. I mean, if, if, if they weren't hard, it would be called something else. Trials are hard. They're just difficult. They're heavy on our souls. They occupy our minds. They cause us to lose sleep. We lose our appetite. We get anxious. We think things we shouldn't think. We consider things we shouldn't consider. We sometimes do things we shouldn't do or fail to do things that we should do. When, when life gets difficult, that, that pressure of a trial, it causes us to want to escape. That's the natural instinct, to just get out of pain, to get out of hardship, to get out of difficulties, to avoid making the tough decision, to avoid uh, you know, having to change the trajectory of life. Whatever the case may be, trials are difficult. And we need a right attitude in order that we may endure them, that God can do his work in the heart of his, of his child. And so James here gives us 
some, some real keepers, some real gems here about the kind of attitude that we are to have and that we need to have. When I, 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 don't, I don't even want to say that we are to have, though we are to have it, because then it sounds like just a, a duty. If you're, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, there's some things that are true about you, whether you feel them every day or not. It doesn't matter if you feel them every day or not. They're true. And when you're going through trials, when, when life is very, very difficult, you need to remember these truths about your life. And they are, they are designed to give us perspective so that we may endure the trials of life well and not take shortcuts and not fall into various ungodly options that the world, the flesh, and the devil offer us. So we're going to start at look verse 9. Well, you know, I have to go back. I just have to. Look, go back to verse 5 because this whole thing, the difficulty with, with, some, with some of these things in James is it's almost like teaching through Proverbs. It seems disconnected, but it's not. And he's been talking about trials. Go back to verse 5 and then we're going to just slide right into verse 9. In the midst of trials, verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. When you're in a trial, if you're lacking wisdom about how should I be thinking about this? How should I consider this? Ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So if you're in a trial today, a very, very valid prayer, before you leave this room today, if you're in a trial today, if there's something really difficult going on, say, God, give me wisdom. How am I supposed to think? How am I supposed to feel about this thing? What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to not do? And not doing sometimes is, is even the harder part, you know, because you, you have these reactions that you want to, to just react to things. God give me wisdom, and God gives liberally, and he doesn't mind. He's happy to do it. Verse 6, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's double-minded and unstable in all of his ways. And I, just, just to really summarize it briefly, last week I said ha, being a double-minded person is having a plan B. Lord, give me wisdom about how to deal with this boss at work that is treating me unfairly. I mean, I, I got looked over uh, you know, not only for the promotion, but now they're going to demote me because I frowned at the boss or whatever. God, give me wisdom. And if you don't, I'm going to slash his tires. <laughs> and if you don't, I'm going to go to human resources and we're going to take care of him. And I know people that can get him removed. And actually, he doesn't know, it, but my uncle's a, oh, his boss and I'll just go to my, you know. Having plan B is being a double-minded person when it comes to trials. And so... To ask wisdom of God is to, God, give me, the, give me wisdom. Give me the right thinking. How do I go through this thing? It's not fair. How do I go through this thing? God, show me how to look at it. And then James starts giving us some specifics, starting at verse 9. And you have to remember that James is writing to early Christians who are losing their homes. They're being persecuted. They're being imprisoned. Some of them are being killed, thrown into the arena to, you know, to fight with the gladiators, to fight with wild beasts, or whatever the case may be. Persecution was intense that first century. They're going through a lot of trials. Some of them have lost their possessions. Some of them are neglected in the marketplace. They won't get hired for a job because they're a Christ follower. They, 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 people won't buy their, their wares and what they're selling because they follow Jesus. So part of the trial is that sometimes you can be out of money. Look what he says here in verse 9. What's, what's, what's the prayer in verse 5? Give me wisdom. Okay, here's some wisdom. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. There are some Christians that, that are really struggling and do struggle with finances and material possessions and for lack of provision. He says to, the, to that person, to that Christian, okay, brother, uh, you're considered lowly, but that's temporal, you need to remember the eternal truth. Look at your notes. The Christian who is materialistically poor in this world ought to, give, ought to glory in his exaltation, exalted position as a child of God. And there's a number of things that I listed there. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven you. When you take your last breath, you're not going to be too concerned whether you had money or not. You're going to be looking into eternity and you're going to say, God, thank you. Somebody preached the gospel to me. I said, yes, you changed my heart. You made me born again. I was poor in this life, but Lord, I'm going to, I'm going to riches now. 
I'm going to heaven now. And that's the, that's the attitude that the lowly brother, the poor brother, the one without provision has to keep in mind. You have to remember God is with you all the days of your life. He's been guiding, protecting, providing. Though you might not have much, you're not dead yet, right? And if you starve to death, it's just the only the way that God wanted to get you into heaven. That's the only time that he didn't provide a meal for you. He just provided an entrance into glory. The lowly brother, though he may not have much, is still here, and God is meeting his needs. God has a place in heaven for him, reserved for him. The eternal promises and the blessings far outweigh the temporal shortcomings. And so that's the attitude. There has to be an attitude towards eternity. There has to be a thought of, man, I don't have it here, but Lord, I'm gonna have glory there. And so I'm gonna get through this. I'm not gonna let this thing derail my faith. I'm not gonna let this unfairness cause me to think poorly of you, Lord. I'm not gonna let somebody's sin cause me to sin, Lord. There's a good one for you. Okay, you're dismissed. <laughs> Don't let somebody else's sin cause you to sin. It doesn't have to be that way. We have, a, we have one of those cool Christian magnets on our refrigerator next to all of our wonderful grandchildren. And it says something like this, never look for justice in the world, but never cease to give it. Don't expect justice in this world. It's an unjust world. Don't be surprised when, when it isn't fair towards you. Don't be surprised when it's unfair towards you. But in the midst of that, keep eternity in mind. These truths ought to help the lowly brother endure temporal hardships. Are you gonna be, uh, uh, or am I gonna be a kind of a myopic, short-sighted person? Look, at God has promised eternity for Bill Walden because of my faith in Jesus Christ and promised eternity for you if you're following Jesus. Are you gonna be a short-sighted Christian and just be mad about today? and not let the glory of eternity affect the unfairness of today, we are called to look beyond today. Amen, guys? Our citizenship is in heaven. And so you look forward to that. No, it's not fair today. That's why it's a trial. It's hard. It's a heaviness. That's why you're called to bear up under it. It's like carrying something heavy. And, it's, and yes, it has you, you know, bowed over. And yes, it's bending your back and, and, and heavy on your heart and all of those things. But one of the things that gets us through it is looking into, looking into the future, looking into eternity. And so he says, you know what? You're a lowly brother, but in so many ways, you're rich. Paul said to the church at Corinth, all things are yours. Whether it be Christ, whether it be Cephas, whether it be Apollos, he named all these teachers. Whatever it is that God has, it's all yours. It's yes and amen for you. And so we're called to look into eternity. He warns, next, the next couple of verses, verses 10 and 11, the rich in his humiliation, let, let him consider himself, uh, remember his, the fragility of his life, the rich in his humiliation, because as the flower of the field he will pass away, no sooner is the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, the flower falls, his beautiful appearance perishes, so the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. There can be Christians, Christ followers, that do have a lot of money, but they are told as you go through trials, the thing that bears you up under the trial isn't that you have more money than your boss and therefore you can hire a better lawyer or something like that. The, the, the strength of you going through trials isn't that you, can't, that you can hire the best counselor or once again lawyer or you know, some person or some group to help you tip things in your favor so that the trial and the hardship will go away. How many of you guys have driven over the grapevine on Highway 5? Okay, most of us, okay. You ever been through there right after the rain when the poppies bloom and the wildflowers? It's amazing. Why don't you normally see that? Because it's usually too hot. <laughs> but if you've been through there after, the, after a rain, I've seen some pictures and you guys have, you know, if, how many of you have seen the flowers on the grapevine? See, not too many of us compared to how many of us have driven over the grapevine because they burn away so quickly. When they're there, they're amazing. Everybody go home today and Google flowers on the grapevine, okay? And, and you'll be amazed. It's like, as you, next time you'll go through there, imagine, I mean, just the array, the colors, they're just, they're just incredible, but they die off really quickly because it gets really hot up there. And so the lowly brother can glory in his exaltation in the things of God. The lowly brother needs to be careful because 
all of that worldly exaltation basically is gonna be lowered and you're not gonna take any of that with you. And so as they say, the ground at the foot of the cross is all level. The, the, the poor man, the rich man, basically we are all brought low, if you will, before Jesus Christ. And we will all be exalted in the same way. And it's just simply a warning that if you're going through a trial today and you're, and you're leaning on your money, that's plan B. No, no plan Bs. We need to make t-shirts that say plan B with a circle and a slash through them. No plan B. It's Jesus. It's always Jesus. It's always plan A. That's it. And the rich man can have plan B and C and plan D and all those other things. But he needs to remember, as it says here, verse 11, verse 10, let the rich glory in his humiliation. What humiliation? The humiliation that he can't take any of his riches with him. And the glory of that is because the eternal riches far outweigh the temporal riches. Let the rich glory in his humiliation because a flower, as a flower of the field, he will pass away. So it's just a warning to the rich man to not be glorying in his riches as he go, and it's particularly in as he goes through trials. For the five of you here that have money, <laughs> you can buy yourself out of a trial, but has it deepened your faith? It's just made you a clever, carnal believer. There's another t-shirt, no clever carnal believers. <laughs> We need to have a t-shirt shop, I'm telling you. You can make all kinds of money. Yeah. You could buy your way out of a trial. You could, you could, you know, force your way. You could intimidate your way out of a trial by threatening a lawsuit. You, you can use money to get, get out of that hard thing, but your faith hasn't gone an inch deep. You, you just escaped the trial, but you haven't grown. And then when your money runs out, how are you going to deal with trials then? because now you don't have the money. You guys tracking with me? That stuff happens. This whole thing, if, if, if you were here last week, verse three, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, that you may be complete, lacking in nothing, a, a depth and a quality of character in Christian faith that is unshakable. Read, read books like Fox's Book of Martyrs or or uh, Jesus, the Jesus Freaks books about the, mar the martyrs of the faith, people that suffered greatly, even went to their death, endured till the end with tremendous depth of character. I talked last week, I was a little facetious last week. I don't think I sinned, but I was a little facetious. But it was only to make a holy point. Now, some of us are just, you know, we've been in the faith you know, 30, 40, 50 years, but we have the faith of an eight-year-old. In a bad way. We have, the, we have the depth of quality. We have the, the stick to of a child. Because we never want to let ourselves go, go through the hard, you know, the hard testing. We always look for an escape route. We always blame somebody else. We always, you know, rebuke Satan or blame it on God or something else. Guys, God wants to toughen us up. And some of us need to get toughened up. All of us need to get toughened up. I'm not thinking about it in any particular. We all need to get tougher. I don't think better times are ahead. Honestly, and I think especially in regards to the church. I think my children and my grandchildren are going to face hard times if they want to follow Jesus. Harder times than we are. They're going to need to have tough faith. They're going to have to, they're going to, have to be tested. It's going to cost more, I think, to follow Jesus in the next generation. I really do. I'm not trying to be a doomsday guy or anything like that. Have you noticed the trends over the last 20 or 30 or 40 years? The, the trends are not towards celebrating the life of Jesus Christ on a national level. And so we're warned here, we're, enc we're encouraged to, to let, let the trials have their work, let patience have its work. And then if you're a, a lowly brother, remember eternity, and if you're a rich brother, remember the temporality of your riches because they're not gonna go with you and get through the trials in the same way that a lowly brother does, with faith. Look at a couple of verses here and then we're gonna go on. Uh, there's a verse here, 1 John 2, 17. The world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. The trials are gonna pass. We read a funny story today on J. Vernon McGee's website. He, he, he talked about a, a, uh, 
the church I used to go to, they, they would share their, their favorite verse and a deacon stood up one day and they said, what's your favorite verse? And he says, this too shall pass. And, uh, oh no, this came, it came to pass. It came to pass, excuse me, it came to pass. And they said, why do you say that? Well, trials, they don't come to stay, they come to pass. <laughs> They're gonna pass. They're gonna pass. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So whatever you're going through, and I said this last week and we're gonna go on, kind of a review today. Whatever you're going through today, it's gonna, it's gonna end. It's gonna end. And some of it might not end until you're dead, but it's gonna end. But, but it can end with you growing tremendously as you endure it in a godly fashion, or it can end and you haven't benefited a bit, you've only suffered. Why not benefit from your trials, amen? Why not benefit from them? Become a deeper more Christ-like person because of them and not just have an escapist mentality. Uh, also another verse here, uh, a guy named Linsky. Look at your notes if you would. As the poor brother forgets all his earthly poverty, so the rich brother forgets all his earthly riches. By faith in Christ, the two are equals. And that's where we need to be, faith in Christ. That's how we get through trials. Remembering the promises of God and remembering that it came to pass the trials will pass it's either a test from God to prove who you are and what you are or it's a temptation from Satan to entice you to sin but we get through both tests and temptations the same way now look at verse 12 let's keep going blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he has been proved he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him got some definitions for you it's important that we understand words Words are how we communicate uh, precepts and, con and concepts. Blessed. The word in the Greek is makarios. It's a great word. It's the word that Jesus used in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, you know, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled, etc. The word means to be supremely blessed and happy. So let's go back to verse 12. Supremely happy is the man, you with me so far, who endures to bear bravely and calmly. Supremely happy is the man who bravely and calmly endures. Temptation, affliction, trial, enticement to sin, or a test to prove the quality of our faith. You with me? I'm paraphrasing, verse 12. Supremely happy is the man who patiently and calmly endures either a test from God or an enticement from Satan. That's what he's saying so far. Sometimes it's God, sometimes it's the enemy. Notice what the, Bible, what the verse doesn't say. The verse doesn't say, blessed is the man who's never tempted. If you're never tempted, you never grow. You can, you can be really good at lifting weights, but it doesn't matter much if they're air weights. It's like, I play a great air guitar. There's nothing there, okay? It doesn't say, blessed is the man who, 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 who endures or is free of temptation. It also doesn't say, blessed is the man who finds temptation easy to conquer. It doesn't say that either. It says this, guys, and it's, guys, I, I, you need to understand it's very much about the difficulty of the trial and very much about how you respond. That's the whole point. That's the whole point. If you need brain surgery, do you want the guy doing brain surgery on you that had a 2.7 GPA? No, thank you. If, if you, you know, do you, want, do you want the law enforcement officer that graduated 120th in the class of 125? No, thank you. You know what I'm saying? Testing, proving the quality of somebody's education or ability or training. You don't want the airplane pilot that, that, that kind of passed the test to fly you across, you know, the Atlantic or something like that. You want the guy that passed with Flying colors, no pun intended, okay? You want the guy that, that was tested and was proven. You want the lawyer that passed the bar exam and got, you know, 100% on all of his tests. You want the person that had to work hard to, so that they could be tested, so that they could be proven, so that their expertise and the depth of their character in their specific field works on your behalf. Does that make sense? Why don't you want to be that kind of person if you like to avoid testing? You have nothing to offer anybody. You can't encourage anybody about hang in there, unlike me. <laughs> hang in there, Will. How do you know? Let me tell you what I went through. 
And then you give your testimony and somebody's like, wow, you, you got through all of that. I can get through this too. Thank you for that testimony. Testimonies are a result of, a t- of going through a test. You go through it. The harder, the f- there's an old saying, the, ho- the hotter the fire, the harder the steel. When you're tempering steel, that fire needs to be hot. For you to become a solid, deep Christian that can hold your ground in the face of 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 an ungodly culture, increasingly ungodly culture, you need to have deep roots in the Lord and that comes from being tested. And we have to go through these things. It's it's not about never being tested and how's how's your life? Oh, God's good. I'm never tested. Well, God's good, but you're missing something. You're, you're, You're looking right past your tests. Or God's good. It's easy to get past these trials. Well, then... You need some more. (laughs) Because we don't get deeper. We don't get stronger. You should see your faces right now. I love you guys. (laughs) You see my face, I imagine. It has to be hard. The depth, the the, the depth, the quality of the depth of your faith, I'm, Imagine like a mathematical problem. Here's like amazing Christ-likeness. Love, patience, kindness, accepting all people, wisdom, all of these things. Put an equal sign and just put a big mess of tests over here. These are the hardest things of my life. But you went through them and this is the result over here. If you're unwilling to go through these things, there's not gonna be anything over here. There's not gonna be what should be over here. And God is the one that's doling these things out or allowing them to happen in our lives. And the world needs some authentic Christians, don't you think? The world doesn't need Christians that are just spouting off verses and, and, and just all about everything but following Jesus. The world doesn't need that stuff. The world needs to see Jesus in us. You don't think Jesus was tempted, right? Jesus was tested. And so we have to go through these things. Look at your notes. The verse doesn't say, blessed is the man who's never tempted. It doesn't say, blessed is the man who finds temptation easy to conquer. It does say, blessed is the man who endures and gets through temptation. One of the commentators I read said this, when we say no to temptation, we're saying yes to God. When you say no to temptation and enticement to, do, to sin, you're saying yes to God. Some other, some other definitions here. Enduring the test means not giving in to escape the test, not compromising, not taking an ungodly way of escape to end the hardship. Somebody criticizes you and so you want to change churches. Guess what? They're probably going to follow you. <laughs> or their cousin that lives at the other church. We want to escape these things. It's natural, but we, we ought not to. Enduring the temptation, not giving in to the sinful enticement. There's two things. We need to endure tests, and we also need to endure temptation and enticement to sin. We don't want to wrongfully indulge ourselves in the lust of the eyes of the flesh and the pride of life. It means to choose to do what Jesus would do in the face of temptation and enticement to sin. Look at verse 12 again, guys, if you would. Blessed is the man, supremely happy is the man or woman who calmly and patiently endures very difficult situations. For when he has been proved, when the test results come out, this is the purpose of God to approve the quality of your faith, to show the world your faith. Remember what God, and I quoted it last week, guys. Remember when when Satan came to to God in heaven and, and said, you know, and, and God said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's nobody like him. It just makes me wonder within, you know, there's a thin veil between the here and the now and eternity. Eternity exists right now. We just don't, we just don't see it. Eternity is all around us. Eternity exists. There's no time in eternity. The old example, I've said it a bunch of times. If you're new to the church, you'll think I'm really clever. If you're, if you're old, then it's like, that again (laughs) 
If there's a parade going by and you're standing on one place and watching the parade go by, you're watching a linear line. You're watching time go by like this. But if you're up in the Goodyear blimp, you see the whole parade all at once. You see the whole parade all at once. And God lives outside of time. And when God brags on one of his children, all of eternity hears about it. When he speaks well of of one of his saints, when one of his saints is proven and shown to have extreme faith in the goodness and in the character of God, the goodness and the character of God is exalted in all of eternity to whoever's watching, the angels, the demons, whoever's watching. And it's recorded, for biblical characters, it's recorded in this book so that for the last, you know, however many thousands of years, The character of those people is seen as exalting the goodness of God. I don't know that I can adequately even say these things today. I'm just like, how do you describe this stuff? There have been people in our church that have gone, you know, through hell. There have been people in our church that have gone through unimaginable circumstances, unbelievable difficulties. And I know for a fact, other people have said, I I wanted to go to your church and I wanted to watch that person's life because I couldn't believe how strong their faith was. That's amazing to me. The person that wanted to go watch that other person's life, they were inspired by that person's life. They were inspired by the ability of God to keep such a person in such a hot fire and in such high floodwaters as that person didn't seek to escape the trial, but they went through the trial. And God could say of that person, have you considered my servant so-and-so? Their life speaks of the goodness of God. Their Their life speaks of the strength of faith that God can impart to a man or a woman so that man or a woman does not deviate. And the difficulty of the trial is equally matched by the praise that comes out of it if we are willing to go through it in a godly fashion. We have a good, we have a good um, uh, well, I don't want to just single out the 30-somethings, but we have a real nice group of 30-somethings here with young kids, and, and there's the rest of us. But we are all being an example. I was going to say, you know, I, I, I'm still being an example for my children. If Jesus doesn't come back in the rapture of the church, they're going to they're gonna have to slash get to watch me handle death. I pray that the way I get to and have to handle death will encourage their hearts to have faith in Jesus so that they can encourage my grandchildren, our grandchildren, to have faith in Jesus. When the cancer comes, when the, you know, the, the money isn't there or whatever the case may be, you, and you guys with 30, the 30-somethings, you are modeling what it looks like to go through trials so that your kids can know that God is good. And our lives speak volumes, don't they? Amen, everybody? Our lives, they ought to be speaking volumes. Well, they do speak volumes. Volumes of good or volumes of maybe not so good. But this is what this thing is all about. Blessed is the man, verse 12, who endures the hard things when he has been proved, when when the trial is over. Somebody will say, well, they just got out by the skin of their teeth, or they will say, man, look how they changed. Look at the faith. Their life is so admirable. And then to top it off on top of that, verse 12 For when he has been proved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. This idea about receiving the crown of life, another whole Bible study perhaps, but the Apostle Paul does talk about, you know, is our life wood, hay, and stubble, or gold, silver, and precious stones, and that there will be rewards for our life. And I do believe that as God brings trials into our lives, how we respond to them in, in, in the here and the now will determine the recognition that God gives us when we're there in glory with him. It's not about losing our salvation or anything. It is, staying, it is about enduring to the end, but it's also about what is called the crown of life, which some commentators are saying it's the special recognition before the throne of God. 
We don't invite these trials into our lives, but we're called to endure them. And as we do, there's a recognition that God has for us. Also, I want you to consider uh, um, verse 12. I'm kind of all over it today. I, forgive me. I'm kind of just grasping here, but I trust that the Spirit will connect the dots for you guys. Look at verse 12 again. For when he has been proved, he'll receive the crown of life. What, 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 are, the, what are the results? Turn your, turn your page over. We're on page two now. What, is the, what are the results of you enduring a trial in a godly fashion? I'm just going to read it, okay? We've already been told supreme joy, happiness, an emotional, spiritual state of well-being. Isn't it, isn't it wonderful when you're going through a trial, you know you have an ungodly option, but you say, no, I'm not going to gossip about that. I'm not going to find a way out of this thing. I'm not going to take an ungodly option. Or you're enticed to sin, and you could give in, and, and maybe nobody would know about it, but you just keep saying no, see, no, 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 and then it's over, and you go, gosh, that feels good, right? Gosh, that feels good. I didn't do that thing. I didn't say that thing. I didn't take that shortcut. Man, I feel good. Conversely, we know how it is on the other way, right? Gosh, I feel bad. <laughs> I, wish I, I wish I wouldn't have quit. I wish I would have endured. I wish I would have finished that ministry task. I wish I wouldn't have given in to that enticement. It says it right there, guys, in verse 12. Supremely happy is the man who endures patiently and calmly difficult trials. There's a joy that happens when, you, when we do that. Also, when we endure trials in a godly fashion, there is no shame or sorrow what giving into sin or, or failing to do what God wants us to do can often bring shame and sorrow. But there's supreme happiness when we endure it in the way that God wants us to. When we don't endure, there's damage control and cover-up, hoping that nobody will find out, right? And nobody's going to be nodding their head on these, I know, right? You'll be pointing at the person across. Oh, yeah, I hope they're listening over there. <laughs> If we are called to do something well before the Lord and we don't, if we're enticed to sin, remember we're talking about testing and enticement to sin, temp, uh, trials and temptations. If we fail in those things, we can be blame shifting, we can be giving all kinds of reasons why it didn't work out right, we can be doing damage control. If we endure those things and get through them, there's no disappointment, but instead there's happiness at having endured we got through it. There's a godly joy. There's a sense of saying, Lord, thank you. I never thought I'd get through that. Thank you. You helped me to forgive that person. I didn't want to go into that reconciliation meeting. I didn't want to see that person again. They were dead to me in my heart. But you told me to pray, and I started praying, and then they started being nice to me. I started being nice to them. I can't believe they're my friend again. I wanted to keep them as an enemy. They were a good enemy. God, thank you. Thank you that I, I let you change my mind. Can't believe that you changed me so much. Or the other person five years later, more bitter, more hateful, more, more sour, less faith. Guys, I, I just want you to embrace this. Verse 12, supremely happy is the man who patiently and calmly endures hardships because there's so many benefits. And James is telling us about these things. And he says, there's a crown of life that is given to those who love him. This is the motive for resisting temptation. This is the supreme motive. I've given you some other motives. There's good reasons to avoid temptation. Enticements to sin. What it does to you, what it does to others. The law, loss of money, loss of jobs, shame and sorrow, all these things. But our highest motivation ought to be, you know what, because I love God. When you... When, when you are being tested to do something right and, and you don't want to do it, when you're being enticed to do something wrong and you do want to do it, dear Christian, do you ever stop and say to yourself, you know what, Lord, I don't want to hurt you. Do you ever stop and say that? I hope that you do. It needs to be that. Lord, I don't, gosh, I don't want to do this against you. Remember what Joseph said when he was being enticed and, and tempted by Potiphar's wife. Joseph was put into slavery in Egypt, away from his family, and he rose to a place of prominence within uh, the house of the king of Egypt, and, and the king's wife 
uh, you know, really had an eye out for Joseph and she was real sweet on him and she tried to seduce him. Look what Joseph said, Genesis 39. At the moment of, trying to, of her trying to seduce him, she sa- he said, there's no one greater in this house than I, nor has your husband kept back anything from me but you because you are his wife. That's why I can't have you. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Maybe it would help, you know, for you in a, in a godly fashion to visualize Jesus right there. You're crossing your arms and saying, I'm not going to forgive that person. They wronged me. Oh, there's a test for you. I'm not going to forgive them. They wronged me. And Jesus goes, you know what? Would you forgive them, please? How can you say no to that? You can, but you can't with a good conscience. Or when you're being enticed to sin, you know, tempted to sin. Jesus Jesus is there. Those are the things that he died for. How can... And we do these things and we fail. I'm not preaching perfection or legalism here. I'm just saying James is trying to reason with our hearts here about how we get through the hardships of life. Jesus is there. And so, verse 12, we move on. Crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. I pray that our highest motivation would be, Lord, I don't want to do this against, against you. It's not just, I don't want to do this because it's wrong against my wife or my husband or my kids or the church or my job. Or, I don't want to do this against you. Or conversely, I want to do this good thing for you. It has to be personal, right? Right? Yes or no? It has to be personal. This isn't religion. We always talk about this isn't religion, it's relationship. Then let's have a good relationship with Jesus. Let's have a good relationship with Jesus. That's the highest motivation. Not that you might get caught. It's a motivation, but it's not the highest. The highest is because of love for God. So those are, that's under number one. Those are truths that help us endure trials. That's mindset stuff. Let's, let's f- try to finish this thing up here. Verse 13 to, to 18. Understanding sin. No one, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt any, himself anyone. Each one of us is tempted when we're drawn away by our own designs, desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. Sin, when it's full grown, gives, brings forth death. God tests us, but he doesn't tempt us. God is never the source of temptation. You might be facing a real temptation right now, and, and, and you might be saying, God, why are you doing this to me? Why, why are you putting this opportunity to sin in front of me? Why are you tempting me? God doesn't tempt anybody. It's not even within his nature himself to be tempted by sin, and it's never his intention to tempt you with sin. It, might, it is his intention to allow temptations to come to you, but his motivation is to prove your faith, not to destroy your faith. Does that make sense? So God doesn't test us. God, excuse me, God does test us, but he doesn't tempt us. You can read James 4, 1 to 7. That's your afternoon homework. We will be having a test. As long as we're on earth, we're going to be having a test. Sin begins with us, not with God. The sin that we struggle with, and now he's moving on to enticement to sin. The sins that we struggle with, guys, begin with us. He says they are our own desires. They're, they're our desires. They're your desires. They're my desires. First uh, John 2.15, look at your notes. We are told, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. All that's in the world, and this is how, this is, this is how my mind works, these are, the, these are the predispositions towards sin that we have. This is how I understand it. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh is to, to please your body. It might be with sex. It might be with a, a way overly priced food. <laughs> it might be with insanely priced wine. It might be with like a sinfully expensive couch or whatever. whatever. I'm a bit of an audiophile myself, so I have to moderate my you know, audio expenditures and all that, okay? But, I'm, but that's what we are all predisposed to something. Your predisposition towards sin might have to do with the flesh. It might have to do with the lust of the eyes, which is materialism. Maybe you don't care about sex and good food and all that. You just like owning stuff. 
Or the third thing, the pride of life. You don't care about the lust of the flesh. You don't care about materialism. You just want everybody making sure that they know that you're the best thing that ever happened. That's how I see sins among mankind breaking down. And I think we're all predisposed to something. You know, you look at that list. I think it's wise to know about yourself. If you fail, where is it most likely going to be on that list? Know that about yourself. Say, Lord, I'm, I'm weak in this area. I'm weak in this area. I'm weak in that area. Sin begins with us. It says in Ephesians 2, verse 3, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh. He's talking about unbelievers. He says we used to live like them. We used to live conducting ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath just as others. We, we, we come out of the womb with a predisposition towards sin. And then we prove it, probably about at age 18 months or something like that. We start showing our little sinfulness. Those little kids are so cute, but they're little sinners, aren't they? They're just little sinners. You know. why, why, why aren't the first words out of a baby's mouth, yes, mother dear? You never hear that. It's always no. It's always no, right? A little sinfulness comes out right away. Sin starts with us. If you, if you are being enticed to sin, don't blame God. I don't know if anybody here tempted to do that. I've never heard really anybody ever tell me. I think it's God's fault. That I think God's tempting me to commit adultery and it's his fault. I've never heard anybody say that. But, it, but it's here, so it must happen at some point. Somebody must do it. I don't know who. That person should say, I'm being tempted to commit adultery and it's because I struggle with the lust of the flesh. And it's my problem. Or the lust of the eyes or the pride of life. The sin is your issue. Don't blame God. It's your issue. It's not your spouse's issue. It's not your, your dad's fault or your grandma's fault or anybody else's fault. Don't call you're not a victim. It's your, it's your issue. Own it. it. It says it right there, right? Verse 14, each one of us is tempted when we're drawn away by our own desires. You have to own it. You have to, you have to confess it. Lord, I struggle with lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, Name it and, and, and say it to God. I struggle with this, God. Forgive me, strengthen me, give me wisdom when that thing comes. Give me wisdom. Like, like James said earlier. Enticed, it means when the bait is offered. When the bait is offered, then we decide whether we're gonna take the bait or not. If we take the bait, desire is conceived. Interesting language. It's like when the human sperm and the human egg meet. It's a small little thing, but look what it turns into. Two, two single cells meeting and then it develops into a person and, and that's oftentimes how sin is. There's this little temptation and there's your little predisposition towards sin and you give into it and you think it's just gonna be this and it just explodes, doesn't it? And that's the nature of sin. If it continues to grow, it brings death, it produces all kinds of death if it's left unchecked, if it's not repented of, that's the nature of sin. It's like a cancer, it just keeps growing and wanting more and more and more. A couple of ideas here before we come towards the end here. By the way, if you have any questions, text them in. A couple of ideas. We are talking here about, I think, knowing your predisposition and if you know your predisposition, you know what kind of temptations to avoid. And I think it's really wise that you avoid being with certain people or in certain places or whatever the case. If you know what you're prone to, guys, avoid those things so that, so that desire and, and t the temptation and, and those things don't meet and start producing death in you. May I suggest a couple things? Look at your notes if you would. Number seven, let us not be the source of temptation to other people. Live carefully. Don't bring up certain situations. Don't wear certain kinds of clothes. Don't encourage people to go to certain places if you know that's a problem for them. Because you have freedom with X, Y, Z, it doesn't mean that they do. So don't be a source of temptation for other people. Secondly, know yourself and stay away from those sources of temptation. Let me finish up. Verse 16 
Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be the kind of first fruits of his creatures. Don't be confused about temptation. God can only give good gifts. He is called here, we're told in verse 16, don't be deceived, brethren, in regards to what? Thinking that temptation is from God. Temptation is not from God. It starts in your own, it's in your own soul. And then in 17, every good <coughs> gift and every perfect gift is from, a, from above. He's called the father of lights, or more literally in the Greek language, the father of the lights. He's the father of the celestial bodies. One commentator put it this way, the sun is always shining, it's the earth that turns away from the light. And sometimes that's us, isn't it? God is always holy, but sometimes it's us turning away from his holiness into the darkness. And then we start thinking, God, why are you doing this to me? He's not doing it to, to us. It's our own sin nature living in this corrupt world. Don't, summary of this little passage here, this little section is don't blame God. It, it's you. It's me. Own it. And watch out for it and endure it and push through it and don't take the shortcut so when it goes, when it's done, you can go like this. Yes! We are the champions, my friends. Right? It's like, yeah, I do. I passed the test. All right, I feel good. Supremely blessed is the man. I feel blessed right now. There's lots of reasons to not sin. Your love for God, but there's a joy that happens when you say, I'm not going to give in to this temptation. I'm not going to do it. I'm not gonna. Look, I like what Damien Carr says. You stand in front of the mirror and just say, no, no, no. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Another thing that a, one pastor said, it takes a, a, a passion to fight a passion. It takes a greater passion. Have a great passion for God, and the supreme, supremely blessed experience will be upon you. I'll get into verse 18 next week. It's an amazing verse. You can look at your notes. By his will, he brought us forth. By his will, nobody had to talk God into, I guess I'm talking about it now. God, nobody had to talk God into making you born again. He did it because he wanted to so that he could bring forth his fruit through your life. So when sin happens, we don't blame God. We own it. And then we fight through it. Questions? Regard, regarding verse 12, if a test is not sent by God or a temptation doesn't come from the enemy, then is the test or temptation useless? I think it's one or the other. I think it's a test of God or a temptation that comes. I, th I, th I, think, it's, I think it's one or the other from what we've studied so far, but I'll keep reading. Uh, Simply part of the difficulty of life that's common to all people, regardless of what they believe, if the test temptation not sent by God or the enemy can be useful, give an example of scripture to support that. If the test temptation not sent by God or the enemy. I, th I think it's all useful, and I don't have time to look something up. Um, I mentioned last week, God does send tests to, to show the purity of our faith. Satan does send temptation to try to derail us. And I did say last week that some things just happen. The paint fades on your house because we live in a, in a fallen world. That does trace back to the Garden of Eden when, when Satan said to Adam and Eve, did God really say you shouldn't eat from the tree? So all sin, all, all bad stuff that happens does trace back to the garden. It does trace back to that. But in the here and the now, I don't think God has a special set of demons that is assigned to making sure that you get a flat tire. I think you, we just get flat tires because tires wear out. Because dumb people litter on the highway or whatever else, okay? But how we endure those things is always going to give opportunity for the world to see us act in a godly manner so God will get the glory. I don't think anything is wasted in our lives. He makes, we, Adam, Adam led us in the song this morning, he makes all things work together for our good. So everything counts. Let's stand together. Thank you, Lord, that you do make all things work together for good for those who love you, the called ones according to your purposes, Lord. I pray for myself, for us, that we would... Uh, 
pass the tests that you put before us, Lord, and that you would get glory for that. I pray that we would say no to sin, Lord, and that the supreme happiness that follows would be enjoyed by us and that you would get the glory for that. Lord, use us, have your way with us, strengthen us, convince us of your ways, Lord. I pray your blessings on each one here, God. Thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen.